We have a subject before us over the course of this next two days which is very important and fundamental. And this title that you can see on the screen behind me, The Unleavened Bread of Sincerity and Truth, is of course taken from the the words of the Apostle Paul. And I'd like you to to join me as we commence this study in the first of Corinthians at chapter 5. Because there that the Apostle makes mention of this phrase, the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, and it's important to understand the context in which he says those words. There was a serious moral problem in the Ecclesia at Corinth. It's referred to in verse 1 of this chapter. Uh, a case which Paul said wasn't even named amongst the Gentiles. And the Corinthians had not been diligent in dealing with that problem. They had left the offending brother in their midst and had not dealt with him. And so the apostle writes concerning that matter. And he says in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 5, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Now it's uh, it's interesting that this, this word leaven, zumi, occurs 13 times in the New Testament. And 13 just happens to be the biblical number of rebellion. And that's what had happened here. He was a brother who was involved in very serious moral conduct, immoral conduct, and the ecclesia had not dealt with it. And Paul says, well, if you don't deal with it, it's likely that that kind of behaviour is going to leaven the whole ecclesia. So he says in verse 7, Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Now this phrase, purge out, as you can see, means to cleanse thoroughly. The only other occurrence of that word in the New Testament is 2 Timothy 2.21 where Paul says in the context of vessels in the house of God he talks about vessels unto dishonour and this particular brother was a vessel unto dishonour and he said you've got to purge yourselves from these. And of course the purpose of removing fellowship from someone is not just to get rid of the leaven brothers and sisters it's also about recovery. If you don't deal with it properly, you're not going to be able to recover. And we know what happens here because it's got a happy ending, hasn't it? They did put this brother out of fellowship and he was brought back in after repentance. So that's what should be happening uh, in our community because the whole point of the exercise is, one, to make sure that the immoral behaviour doesn't sweep through the ecclesia and influence others. And secondly, we want to see everyone in the kingdom, even the offender. And so that's why you deal with it this way. The word old here just happens to, of course, be used in very interesting contexts like Romans 6 verse 6, referring to the old man of the flesh. So he says, Purge out therefore the old leaven. And here's that word, leaven, which means, it has the idea of fermenting, as if boiling up. And it comes from the root zeo, which means to be hot or fervid. And so, of course, it's obviously a reference to the activity of the lust of the flesh, which he's made reference to in verse 1 of this chapter, when he talks about uh, an unusual case of fornication in the ecclesia. But you might be a new lump, he says in verse 7, as ye are unleavened, for even our Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Now, this word lump is the, means a needed mass, and Paul is speaking here of the ecclesia, of course, which he later on refers in 1 Corinthians 10 as the, as a loaf of bread or one bread. We being many are one bread and one body. So we get the idea of uh, what he's saying here. Or, for even Christ our Passover. What a wonderful phrase that is. And of course every first day of the week we come to remember Christ our Passover in the partaking of bread and wine. So this feast of unleavened bread, which is, is referred to by the apostle, saw Israel completely devoid of leaven in their houses for seven days after they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. And of course, seven seven days is a cycle. It's like a lifetime cycle. And the principle that God was teaching Israel was, you must remain free from the domination of sin, corruption of sin, for a life cycle. When you come into the truth, it's all about dedicating your life to to incorruption. And that, brothers and sisters, is what the apostle is calling upon here. And he says in verse 8, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Malice simply means badness or an evil habit flowing from the malignity of the mind. 
And that word is used throughout the New Testament in that context. And the word wickedness here, poneria, means of an e- evil in nature or some delight in evil. And so it's a wicked act of the mind. And that's exactly what had happened in this ecclesia as a man had taken his father's wife. Can't get much worse than that. So what's the answer to this? Well, the answer comes at the end of verse 8, and here is where we get our phrase for the title of this series of studies. But with the unleavened bread, he says, of sincerity and truth. Now, we're going to find that these words, of course, come from the Old Testament. We're going to see their source in the Old Testament. We're going to follow them through today uh, and see just how important they are to us. Sincerity has got the idea of clearness or pureness as found being judged in the sunlight. So if you took a glass, I'm going to take a small bottle of water and I'm going to put it up to the sunlight and I'm going to examine it to see whether or not there's any impurities in it. Of course, there wouldn't be impurities in the water of New England, I'm sure. But, you know, when you put something up and the sun shines through it, you get to see whether or not there's anything impure in it. That's exactly what we should do every time we present ourselves... On a Sunday morning, brothers and sisters, we come to be examined, don't we? We come to examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith. We come to be exposed to the light of Almighty God, of the eyes of his Son, who sees straight through our motivations. And this is the idea, of course, that comes out of the experience of Christ and Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and verses 20 and 21, where he's... He's talking about Nicodemus who crept up to him in the darkness. He said, men love darkness because their deeds are evil. But he said, for everyone that doeth evil hates the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. That's why we present ourselves at the feast, says the Apostle Paul, to purge out the old leaven, to to have the the light of divine truth expose any darkness in our lives. And this word truth, aletheia, means truth as openly manifested by appearance in the sense of, of one having nothing to hide. And that's the spirit with which we should enter uh, uh, the memorial meetings. So what what are we aiming to achieve in this study, do you think, taking that, that phrase from the Apostle Paul? Well, these are the objectives of our study over the course of this weekend. We want to increase our understanding of the principles surrounding the memorial meeting. We've just spoken briefly about that. We want to examine our progress and personal standing before God at the end of an age which is full of wickedness of every kind, and which we know from the signs, brothers and sisters, as was well said in the opening prayer, we know from the signs that we're very close to the end. It's not going to get any better until we were removed. It's going to get a whole lot worse and very rapidly. Just like the signs are coming very rapidly, the evils of men are increasing exponentially, aren't they? And they're coming in a way that today is not even subtle anymore. So, you know, we're living in very, very difficult times. So we want to test our appreciation of of the spiritual versus the natural in the course of this study, and we want to prepare ourselves to stand before the exemplar of sincerity and truth, the man who never gave in to the promptings of flesh, who never allowed sin or leaven in any form to have any part in his life. It won't be long and we'll be standing before him, and he will be waving to right and left. So we need we need to make sure we're ready for that day. So can I take you back to the beginning? Can I take you back to Exodus 16 when God provided manna? We're going to spend this first session talking not so much about sincerity and truth, but more about the importance of bread. We want to have a look at at what God did for Israel and what that means for you and me. Now Exodus 16 is the chapter in which, of course, manna is given to Israel. And might I say, brothers and sisters, at the outset of a, a brief consideration of Exodus 16, that there's something that it took me a long time to learn. You know, when God gave manna, he didn't give it at 7 p.m. in the evening. He gave it in the morning, and when the sun had fully risen, so when the sun has risen and people are, you know, about their business, it was gone. And it took me a very, very long time to learn the importance of reading the word of God 
in the morning. Now, I can do that. Now, I don't work for Pharaoh anymore. You know, I'm long since retired from the service of Pharaoh. Um, and I can get up in the morning and I don't have too many demands on me so I can read my Bible. But when you have to bus off to work and so on, it's, it's quite difficult sometimes, especially if you're starting work at ridiculous hours in the morning. It's very difficult. But if you can in some way find time in the morning to collect your manna, you're doing it at the time that God expected it to be done. And why would he choose it? Well, he chose it because that's the very best time for the mind to absorb divine things. We're going to see that the manna represents the word of God as we come to consider Exodus chapter 16. It says there, gather a certain rate every day, a very important phrase. And we're going to find that phrase in verse 4 of Exodus 16. It says this, Then said Yahweh unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. Now the people had complained. They complained about hunger. We see at the end of verse 3, You've brought us forth, they said, into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So there was this bitter complaint about the lack of food. So God says, right, I'll provide bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Now, it just so happens that the word bread occurs eight times in the chapter. And we're going to meet this number eight in our studies, especially in our third session today. The number eight is the number of a new beginning that leads to immortality. Eight, like the eighth millennium, we know is going to be a time of total immortality, isn't it? So when you read eight, you know that that's the key thing. And eight times bread is used in this chapter because you see, This particular bread that God gives, his word, is the means to bring people to immortality. It's called manna. Now, Israel had no idea what it was. In verse 15 of this chapter, when they saw it, they said one to another, what is it? Or manna, you see. It is manna, but really that should be spelled out. What is it? They had no clue as to what God was doing for them. Now this word manna just happens to occur five times in Exodus 16 and you find it five times in the New Testament. Now, I don't think that's accidental either because you see five is the number of divine grace. So there's all these little clues along the way that tell us the importance of this manna. Now before we really get into Exodus 16, if you can just pop something in there that might be useful to get back there quickly, I want you to come to Psalm 78 because Psalm 78 provides a divine commentary on what was done here. Psalm 78, and we're going to have a look from verses 22 to 25. We just read this recently in our readings. It's a lengthy psalm of Asaph, and it reviews the wilderness wanderings. And in verse 22 we read, Because they believed not in God, and trusted not in his salvation, now, God's salvation, Yahweh's salvation, of course, Yahshua, Joshua, Jesus, see? So we're going to come to this at the end of our session today because when God gave the bread from heaven in the form of his son, the people to whom he came did not believe in Yahweh's salvation. We're going to see that in John chapter 6. Verse 23, Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven and had rained down manna upon them to eat and had given them of the corn of heaven. Corn of heaven? Yes, it's actually a reference to wheat or cereal of some kind, grain. We're going to come to that in due course, probably tomorrow, in Isaiah 55. I'm going to see how the word of God is referred to in this language. Then it says this in verse 25, Man, and the word here is ish, mighty men, and that's what we should be, great men being prepared for the kingdom. They ate, it says, angels' food. Well, of course, angels don't have to eat any more than what we will have to eat in the kingdom. This word angels actually is the Hebrew word abir. It means simply mighty or valiant. It comes from the root abir, meaning strong or mighty. And it's, that word is only ever used in the Old Testament of God himself. So we actually are eating divine food. Now, of course, it's not literal food in our case, is it? And it shouldn't have been seen by Israel simply as literal food. They should have seen it for what it was. It was the symbol of the word of God, the importance in their lives of the word of God. And that's called the food of the mighty. 
So the preparation of people for the kingdom is going to be done by this food, this bread that came from God out of heaven. And it says there at the end of verse 25 that he sent them meat to the full. And this word meat means provision or food. And this word to the full, sobar, which means to be completely satiated, to have abundance or fullness, the first time you meet this word is actually in Exodus 16 verse 3 where it is said that Israel complained that when they were in Egypt, they ate bread to the full. So there's the contrast. Where's the leeks and the garlics, they said? We were eating to the full in Egypt. No, 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 you got this wrong. When God gave the manna, he gave them bread from heaven. This is the symbol of his word, and they could have that food to the full. The problem was, they didn't realise its importance, and they got sick of it as time went on. So let's come back to Exodus chapter 16 and and see what the reason behind this was. Because it says in verse 4, he says, I'm going to give you a certain rate, and we'll come to that phrase in a minute, every day, that I may prove them, whether they will walk in my law or no. Now this word prove is used. The first occurrence of it is Genesis 22 and verse 1. When God said... To Abraham, take thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, and go to Mount Moriah and offer him there as a burnt sacrifice unto me. God was testing Abraham, of course. And that's what he was doing to Israel. He's testing them. He wants to know what their attitude towards the word of God really is. And it says there that they will gather a certain rate. Now, it just so happens that this word is debar. It means, actually, the speech or the word. This happens to be the word, brothers and sisters, that God chooses to represent his word right throughout the Old Testament. And there's no doubt that that is the meaning here. This word debar used in both the verb form, which you'll find in verse 4, three times in in verses 4, 16 and 32, and in verb form, uh, four more times. So you've got a noun, three times, verb form. So you've got a total of seven. This word debar occurs seven times in this chapter, in this story of the giving of manna. Now that's significant as well, because seven just happens to be, amongst other things, the number of the spirit. It's the spirit number. In fact, the whole Bible is undergirded by sevens, as was pointed out by Ivan Pannon in his extensive works on Bible numerology. The whole Bible is undergirded by sevens. So what we have here is God saying, this manna, this bread that I've given you from heaven is actually symbolic of my word. And of course, in verse 14, you've got support for that because it says there, and when the Jew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. So why? Jew, do you think? Well, Jew is another symbol for the word of God. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 2. And it's called small here. Do you notice that in verse 14? A small round thing. Well, this word, dak, in the Hebrew means thin or small. And it's used in 1 Kings 19 verse 12. When the word of God comes to Elijah and it's a what? A still, small voice. That's the word. So you get all these little clues along the way that the manna was to represent the word of God. And then in verse 16 you read this. This is the thing. Now that word thing there is debar. This is the word which Yahweh hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating. And Omer, for every man according to the number of your persons, take ye every man for them which are in his tents. Now in the margin of my Bible... When it says an omer for every man, it says Hebrew by the pole or the head. Now, in actual fact, that phrase every man in the Hebrew is gol goleth. Now, you might see some similarity with the word gol gotha. Yes, because you see it's actually a reference to a skull or a head. And the point being made here is that when they went out to gather an omer for every skull, or head, God's saying, that's where I want my word. When you go out morning by morning and you're picking up this manna, that's where I'm aiming at. It's for every head, for every skull. I want my word in your skull. 
then I can do something with you. See the principle being thrust upon Israel? They had no idea, brothers and sisters, absolutely no idea what God was trying to do. And neither did the generation that Christ came to. And none understand that the means that God uses to build faith, to build character, to get us into his kingdom, is the power of his word. We need to be gathering that manna, that bread, every day. So what did it taste like, do you think? Well, in Numbers 11, verse 8, we're told it tasted like fresh oil. Fresh oil. You like olive oil? Well, that's the reference to it. It's like olive oil. In Exodus 16 and verse 31, we read it's like wafers. See there? And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed. And coriander seed is an aromatic seed, white in colour. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Now, in this country, uh, it's not uncommon to have waffles or something like that for breakfast, is it? Would you like waffles every morning? Every lunchtime? Every evening meal? Anyone here would like waffles every day? Of course not. But Israel, well, I've got one nodding head there, that's good. That would make mum's job pretty easy, wouldn't it? She just want waffles every meal. But I think most of us can see the point of that, can't we? Is that after a while you would get tired of it. You'd, it would not have the influence on your palate that it might initially have had. And of course, this is the point that's being made, isn't it? Do you find, brothers and sisters, do you find reading and studying the Word of God something that your flesh is really happy with? That, you know, that it, it's, it matches your spiritual palate? Well, yes and no. I know what it's like when you, you know, you approach the study of the Word of God. The flesh goes into self-defense mode. And it says, well, you know, it'd be lovely to have a cup of coffee now. Uh, uh, oh, oh, and the news is on the TV. You know, that's how my flesh operates. And I'll find, it'll find an excuse not to be at the desk or be reading. You know what it's like. This is, there's nothing new in that, is there? That's the self-defense mechanism that is in our flesh. We've all got that problem. But once you get there and you realize the value of what you're doing and you're ruminating upon the word and it's having an effect upon the way you, and you get excited about it, then you can overcome that, can't you, to a large degree. Well, you see, the problem with Israel was they never got past step one. They never saw it for what it really was. And they got sick of it. This manna. Same thing every day. Don't want to, don't want to eat this stuff. Well, we're going to do the taste test. <clears throat> See what it says here in verse 31? And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. So these, it was like a flat, thin cake. Now they tried every, every which way to, 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 to prepare manna. You know, so they would, one day they would boil it and then they would fry it and then they would grill it and, you know, but it always tasted the same. Taste. The word here in the Hebrew, tayan, means to taste, but in a, figure, in a figurative way it means having perceptional judgment, being able to make a decision. So you find this word throughout the Old Testament in the King James Version, it's been variously rendered. You find it rendered as behaviour, uh, as advice, as understanding, as judgment, discretion or reason. In other words, this manner, this, this simple tasting substance like fresh oil, which you ate every meal, was designed to see whether or not your mind was going to be in the right place. Whether you're going to make right decisions about life. God was testing them. He was proving them as to whether or not they would see what it really was. And the same principle applies to us in our lives. Job got this right. He had the correct perspective. He said in Job 23 verse 12, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Is that the way we look at it? That Bible readings every day is much more important than sitting down to eat a meal, necessary food? Well, it should be because, you see, the necessary food that the world thinks that we need 
is not going to get us into the kingdom. It might sustain our bodies for a while, but it's not going to get us into the kingdom. The food of God will. Now we read from Deuteronomy chapter 8, and I'd like you to come along to the 8th chapter of Deuteronomy. We'll be back here in Exodus uh, shortly, by the way. Just have a look at the three types of manna. But I want you to come to Deuteronomy chapter 8, where the purpose of the manna is spilled out in even greater detail. God brought Israel into a waste, howling wilderness. As verse 15 says, he led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, and I can vouch for that. About ten months ago was a group of eight brethren that went through the Sinai Desert uh, with me, and uh, it's a waste, howling wilderness. And I said to the brethren, now, if you had to bring your children, your young children out here and walk through this place, do you think you would have complained? And I said, Every one of them said, yep, you would complain. It's a very, very difficult place, especially with a young family. We're in a fiery serpents and scorpions and drought where there was no water who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint. It's a terribly harsh place. So <clears throat> what was God doing? Well, let's just break this chapter up. Verses 1 to 6, he demonstrates that life was dependent on the word of God. He put them through probation to humble them and to test them. He was chastening them like a son. You see there it says in verse 5, Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so Yahweh thy God chasteneth thee. The same principle of testing that was referred to in Exodus 16 is seen here. It says in verse 2, Thou shalt remember all the way which Yahweh thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee, and to prove thee, to, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no, this is the purpose of the giving of the manna. Now, just if you can, hold your hand in Deuteronomy 8, just come across to Psalm 94. I want to show you what it means in verse 5 of Deuteronomy 8 when it says that God is chastening us as a man chastens his son. How are we chastened, brothers and sisters? Well, if I was to ask that question, some of you would say, well, we're chastened by the circumstances of life, you know, that the things go wrong in life and things happen and we, we get severely ch That's true, that does happen. But that's not the chastening that God would like to use on us. Psalm 94 and verse 12 says this, Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Yahweh, and teachest him, out of thy law. If you look up the Hebrew, these two things are together. This is not something different. The chastening he's talking about in that verse is done by the law. It's done by the word of God. So what God wants to do is to chasten us by his word. Now, if you're chastened by his word, then he's not going to have to bring circumstances to bear to push you back into line, is he? If you accept the chastening of the word and do the right thing, and he's not going to have to take the wheels off in your life if you're not doing the right thing. That's the principle of that. And so he was doing that for Israel. As you come back to Deuteronomy chapter 8, in verses 7 to 20, he points out the danger of prosperity and fullness. So the privation was actually for their good. Privation is actually for our good. See what verse 3 says? And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna. Now that's that's conundrum, isn't it? It says, He humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna. But if you're getting fed with manna, you're not hungry. It's a conundrum. No, no, no. You see, the problem was that the hungering that's referred to was the hungering for the things they left behind in Egypt. The leeks and the garlics and the fish and all the things that they ate in Egypt. He suffered them to hunger for those things, but he provided a substitute, and the substitute was manna, the bread from heaven. And he was going to prove them whether they wanted it or not. And of course, exactly the same principle applies to you and me. Separation is fundamental, isn't it? You come into the truth, separation from the world and its ways and its entertainments and all that sort of stuff is fundamental for the truth. God suffers us to hunger. The things that we used to do, we have to leave behind. And what's going to take its place, brothers and sisters? 
Well, coming to the study classes, doing your readings every day, studying the Bible, coming along on Sunday, and you just keep getting fed the word of God, the manna, which we find very exciting. Well, Israel didn't find it exciting. You see, they didn't see it for what it was. We must see it for what it is. It's the means whereby God is working to shape our lives, to build our faith, to build our character, that it might be like his, so that ultimately we might be there forever with him and his son. That's what he was doing. You know, it's a fascinating fact, isn't it, that this is the first place that Christ quotes from when he's being seriously tested in the wilderness after 40 days of hunger. Anybody here fasted for 40 days? No. How hungry would you be? And along comes the tempter and says, you're the son of God, you can make these these stones bread, and it looked like bread to them in those days. And he said, I'm not going to do that. And he quotes these words of Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3, that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of Yahweh doth man live. And we've got to come to that point where we believe that's true. I want you to come back quickly to Exodus 16 and we're just going to have a quick look at the three types of manna that were provided in the wilderness. And there were three types and they're all here in this chapter, Exodus 16. The first, of course, was that which you gathered for six days of the week, five days of the week, but that lasted overnight. If you kept it to the morning, it had worms that had corrupted had to eat it the same day, which has its own lesson, doesn't it? Now that, of course, was pointing forward to the bread from heaven that God gave to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said of himself in John 6, I am the bread that came down from the Father. I am the bread of heaven. And so it's pointing to the fact that he came in our nature. It's a type of Christ's mortality shared in common with his brethren. So that's the first Type of manna. We have to lower that on the screen, aren't we? I don't know why that's happened like that. The second type of manna was that which lasted over the weekend. It foreshadowed Christ's preservation from corruption over a weekend, so to speak, for three days and three nights. So you gathered on the sixth day, it lasted you through the sixth day, and the seventh day did not corrupt. So it points forward to the fact that Christ would be in the grave, but he would not corrupt. And the third type is mentioned in verses 33 and 34 of Exodus 16. It says in verse 33 that Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein and lay it up before Yahweh to be kept for your generations. As Yahweh commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. Now, eventually, of course, it was put in the ark. The ark wasn't constructed at this time, so it was kept somewhere and then was put in the ark and never corrupted. So it pointed, of course, to the immortality of Christ. It was a type of his immortality and ascension into the presence of God uh, until he appears to give what he calls in Revelation 2 and verse 17, the hidden manna. So this manna which was put in the ark was beneath the mercy seat, Christ, beneath the cherubim, which spoke of the saints, joined to him. Okay? It was beneath that, was hidden away. It was symbolic of the eternal life that will ultimately be given. So if we know what the matter is, ultimately, brothers and sisters, we're going to be given the hidden manner. And that will be eternal life at the hands of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to conclude this session here uh, this morning by taking you to John chapter 6. We're going to see some of the principles that we've picked up from Exodus, Deuteronomy and so on. We're going to see some of those principles uh, come out in John chapter 6. Now again, uh, it would be useful if you could flick back to Exodus 16, but it's not essential. But if you if you can do that, you can see these verses that are quoted here, for example, Exodus 16 verse 15. So the wilderness generation asked, what is it? The Jews in Christ's day failed to perceive the bread from heaven. So when you come to John chapter 6, you read of their unbelief. Verse 28 of John 6. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, 
that ye believe on him whom he has sent. You know, men always want to do something, don't they? What, what work should we do? What good thing can I do that I might have eternal life? You know what Christ's answer is? Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Because that's what will get you to eternal life. That's how God generates faith in you. And you see, as we go on, we're going to see exactly what he meant by these words because he's going to point out that there's no good eating his flesh. That wasn't going to do him any good at all. They had to eat the words that came from his mouth because he was speaking the word of God. But they didn't understand that. And as you read on down to verse um, uh, verse 30, they asked for a sign. In verse 31, they mentioned that our fathers ate manna in the desert and he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're reminding them. Christ of what God had done. And he says in verse 32, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. And it was him, of course. Verse 33. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So, the next step in in the process is this, is the glory of Yahweh was manifested before the manna. We read that in Exodus 16, verse 10. So they saw the glory of God, and then the manna was given. So Christ came on the scene as the bread from heaven. He revealed God's glory as the only begotten of the Father. He was, as we know from John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word made flesh. This is why he can speak this kind of language. I am the bread from heaven. We read in Exodus 16, verses 12 and 13, that the flesh of quail was even given before the manna. Christ said that his flesh was the substance of the bread that he gave for the life of the world in John chapter 6 and verse 51, where he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, yeah, like the flesh of quail, so to speak, which I will give for the life of the world. The manna appeared after the Jew, a symbol of resurrection as well as a symbol of the word of God. We know from Psalm 110 verse 3 and Isaiah 26 verse 19. And so it was that Christ rose early in the morning as the first fruits of them that slept. So what does he say here in John chapter 6? Have a look at verse 54. He says, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Raise him up at the last day? Yes. Yeah. Resurrection and then immortality. That's the process. So you get a bit of a feel of how important manna was to our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it just so happens that bread occurs quite often in John chapter 6. It's here 21 times. And the contrast is between the meat or the food which perisheth, you can see in, in verse 27 of John 6, labour not for the food which perisheth, but for that food which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So you've got this contrast between food that perishes and that which endures to everlasting life, or immortality. Now the terms life, living, Live, quickeneth, which means to give life, occur 19 times from verse 27 to verse 69 in John chapter 6. So it dominates this context. Now we're going to, we're going to explore, God willing, John 6 in even greater detail. We're going to find out where its roots are in our first session tomorrow morning. We're going to have a look at Isaiah 54 and 55 and we're going to see where most of the language of John chapter 6 comes from. So we're going to do that later on. We're just going to try at this stage to summarise what's in this wonderful chapter. By contrast with life and living, we read the term dead or die. It occurs in verse 49, in verse 50 and verse 58. Have a look at verse 49 of John chapter 6. He's just said in verse 48, I am the bread of life. And in verse 49 he says, Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Well, of course they were dead. He doesn't mean they were dead. He means they were dead, dead. Second death, dead. All right? 
So they'll be at the judgment seat. They'll be raised. They'll be there at the judgment seat with you and me. There is no hope for that generation. They are dead, dead. Gone. Why? Well, they ain't manna. But they didn't know what it was. To them it was boring. It was boring to come along to a Christadelphian study classes. I don't want to go. Yeah. Boring to do the readings every day. I raised four children, I know about that. All right. That's the way the flesh is towards the word of God, isn't it? We've got to get to a point, brothers and sisters, where we know why it's important to read every day. It is the bread of the mighty. It's the means that God is using. That's why you see it says in Psalm 138, he's exalted his word above his name. Why would God exalt his word above his name? Well, because you see, his name points to his purpose. His purpose is to have people who manifest his character. How do you develop God's character? By the word. And that's why the word is exalted above the name. He can't fulfill his name without the word working in our lives. It's as simple as that. So let's finish by testing the natural and the spiritual. We've got natural thinkers and we've got spiritual thinkers in John chapter 6, as we're going to see. In verses 48 to 71. Now the first thing you need to notice in this chapter is that Christ had absolutely no desire to lose anyone. That's pointed out in verse 37. Read verse 37. All that the Father hath given me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. Verse 39, towards the end, all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. Now that's a reference back to verse 12. Because in verse 12, when he'd fed the 5,000, he says, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. I don't want to lose anything. This is the word of God. I don't want to lose anything. And yet you'd think he did. Because when you come to what we see in verses 48 onwards, when he talks to the Jews about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, they're horrified. I mean, Jews drinking blood? Nah. Cannibals? You see, the the natural thinkers thought that when he said, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, then he's talking about his literal flesh and blood. And they were horrified by this. You know, as he goes down... As he goes down talking about eating his flesh, you've got to note this fact. There are two different words for eating in John chapter 6. Two separate words. There's the word phajo, which means to, just simply to eat. It's the ordinary, normal word for eating in the New Testament. It just happens to occur 11 times in this chapter. And 11 is the biblical number of failure. Yeah, you can see why that's there. But there's another word, the word trogo, which means to chew and to gnaw, hence to eat and to eat well. There are four occurrences in this chapter and only six in the entire New Testament of that word. So what is he, what do you think he's meaning here? Well, let's pick up, let's pick up the occurrences of this word trogo. I want to show you where they are. Verse 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh. Now there's the word trogo. That word eateth in verse 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. You come down to verse 56. He that eateth my flesh. That's the same word. You come down towards the end of verse 57. So that he that eateth me. There it is again. And in verse 58. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So you see the kind of eating he's talking about, brothers and sisters, is not the not the normal eating that you and I indulge in every day. When you go in into a restaurant or don't sit at a table and we just eat and we stuff food in our mouths. He's talking about people who are like cows. 
They chew on it. They ruminate upon it. So have you ever seen someone sitting in a restaurant that has sort of trouble eating and they're there two hours after they begin and they're still chewing away? You'll probably find if you have meat to dinner, that's what I'll be doing because I've got a few issues. But you see, this is about chewing on it and it's something that I've learned the importance of. You know, when I get up in the morning and I do my readings, particularly when I'm at home, it's not so easy when you're on the road, but particularly when I'm home, I don't just read. I roll it. I ruminate it. Think about why does it say that? What's going on here? Try and go to other passages of Scripture. Now, you've got to have time to do that because it can take you quite some time. But if you can do that, the value is unbelievable. That's eating, trogo. That's chewing on it, fully masticating, making you get sure you get all the value out of it. I can't do that for you. You can't do it for me. It's got to be done by the individual. And when you learn to, to, to read and to ruminate upon the word like that, it's going to have a wonderful influence on the way you think, on the development of your faith, and the development of your character. No question about that. So you see, we'll come to this point in a moment. I just want to point out something, brothers and sisters. They're pretty troubled by what he said thus far. Verse 59 tells us in John 6, These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And they're saying amongst themselves, I don't know whether we should listen to this guy anymore. And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, this is not the twelve disciples, by the way, but the disciples that were there, doth this offend you? Is that a problem to you? Now what would you and I do? Well, we'd soften, wouldn't we? We would sort of say, well, no, that was pretty hard for them all. I'll back off. No. He puts more pressure on them. He says in verse 62, what and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? And then we read, in verse, if you have, verse 66, it says, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They'd had enough. There's the natural thinkers. Because they didn't understand verse 63. Verse 63 says this. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. I'm not talking about eating my literal flesh. You could eat me all day. And it will do you absolutely no good. I'm not talking about the literal body. He says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. It's the words that came from his mouth and he was the word made flesh. And Peter, of course, chimes in a bit further down and says, Lord, we're not leaving you. Because he said to them, you're going to leave me too? You 12, you're going to leave me? And Peter says, Lord, we're not going anywhere. Thou hast the words of eternal life. What a wonderful privilege it is, brothers and sisters, to eat bread from heaven. It is indeed the food of the mighty.